Great, and we are live. So hello again. Welcome to another Red Cloud webinar. Uh, my name is Kobe Kushner. I'm a mining analyst here at Red Cloud, and today we are joined by Lawrence, the president and CEO of Mountain Boy Minerals. So Mountain Boy is advancing a handful of projects in BC's prolific Golden Triangle. The Golden Triangle, as we know, is home to several world-class deposits. It's geologically endowed and cross a variety of deposit types from BMS deposits like SK, uh, the Epithermal uh, Premier Mine, and of course, several world-class porphyry deposits, uh, Galore Creek, Shaft Creek, Saddle, Red Chris, KSM. These deposits can be massive, um, and they can also be extremely profitable to mine. So Mountain Boy has one of the largest land packages in the region, and it has assembled a team of porphyry experts and geoscientists to systematically explore it. Uh, starting with the Telegraph project, where the company thinks it's on to a major copper gold porphyry discovery. Uh, so this is about a 10 million market cap company. It's at a pre-discovery stage all the way to the left on the Lassonde curve. So stocks like this have potential to really move upon an initial discovery. So during today's webinar, Lawrence is going to provide us with an overview and an outlook. And when he's done the presentation, we'll move on to the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder that you can type your questions into the comment box at any time and we'll get to as many as we can as always we do have to run through the fine print so during today's webinar forward-looking statements may be made i would direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on the company's corporate deck which we will see in a moment uh, for red cloud securities inc i would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only it should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities we note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Mountain Boy. And with that, we will now turn it over to you, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Kobe, for that great introduction and, um, and the comments on the Golden Triangle. So, Yes, we are totally focused on the, the Golden Triangle. And um, as Kobe pointed out, this is one of the most richly endowed areas in the world. Most people are aware of the geological endowment, but not everybody is aware of how quickly this area is emerging as a globally important mining district. The majors over the last three years have invested $5 billion in the Golden Triangle. There's now two operating mines, another mine on its way to production, and a massive amount of exploration going on throughout the district. Several of the majors are already well positioned in the district, and others are looking for a way to get involved. So as Kobe pointed out, we're, we're one of the leading explorers in, in this region. We've got multiple projects. We made a deliberate, uh, decision to focus on the Golden Triangle. We know how to operate there, and we've developed a deep understanding of the, the geology of the region, which is, is very important to us in advancing these projects. So our strategy is to um, pull together historic information. There's been a lot of work done in the Golden Triangle over, especially over recent decades, but a lot of that work was narrowly focused. The majors came through in the 50s, 60s, 70s, looking for base metal deposits, copper primarily. 80s and 90s, there were literally hundreds of juniors looking for gold deposits after the discovery of, of SNP and, and SK. So they all had a, a narrow focus. They were looking at tiny little target areas uh, developed a massive amount of, of geological information. And our strategy has been to pull together that information and, um, and then assemble the properties and look at these things on a big picture perspective. Now, if anybody thinks it's easy to consolidate ground in the Golden Triangle, here's the, the current property position. The, any open gaps in here are either covered with permanent ice, they're parks, or it has the wrong geology. But we've been able to identify multiple targets, consolidate the ground, and develop a portfolio of really interesting projects. 
Now, before talking about the Telegraph projects, really quick corporate snapshot. Very low market cap, uh, shareholders um, and management are very closely aligned. Uh, as a management team, we have a, a very big position in the company, so we're our interests are exactly aligned with the other shareholders. We've pulled together multiple projects uh, over the past four years. We've made very good use of, of shareholder money in, in assembling this, this property portfolio and advancing the projects. Very strong team of uh, directors, management, uh, geological people, advisors. My own background, 40 years in the industry, uh, been involved in managing both juniors and majors. I spent 15 years writing an investment newsletter, which gave me a really, really good insight into a lot of projects all over the world. I was recruited by a big U.S. private uh, investment group to set up a mining investment division. For the past four years, I'm, I'm back to what I love doing, which is the, uh, the treasure hunt. Now, I really want to focus uh, attention on, on this group of people. These geologists lay their lives on the line every day they go to work between flying in helicopters and, and working in really rugged mountainous terrain. I've never met a more dedicated, a more committed and enthusiastic group of geologists in my life. Together with the experience and, and the, uh, the knowledge from the, the directors and the advisors, we've got a very powerful geological team. Just brief comment on, on ESG. Everybody talks about ESG these days. For us, ESG is simply doing the right thing. And doing the right thing is, is just, it's our nature. We, we just don't know any other way to do things. And as a result of that, we have tremendous relations with the, the local First Nations, with the other local communities. We've got great relations with all levels of government. And therefore, we, we get local support. We get permits when we need them. And so we're, we're just, just part of what we do is just doing the right thing. Now, Telegraph Project. As Kobe said, there's a lot of deposit types in the triangle. And in particular, there's, there's a number of very large um, world-class porphyry deposits. Our Telegraph Project sits toward the end of the triangle. We're adjacent to Tex Shaft Creek Project. We're just north of the Galore Project. That's a joint venture between Tech and Newmont. Red Chris, oh, sorry, I forget. I, I'm not, you're, you're not seeing my pointer. Um, on, on the east side of it, the Red Chris deposit was acquired by Newcrest. They're operating that mine now. And in 2021, New, uh, Newmont paid $350 million to buy the, um, the Saddle North deposit. So we're in the right neighborhood. We've got exactly the same rocks, the same ages. All the other geological criteria of these nearby deposits, we have all of that on the Telegraph project. Now, <clears throat> As I mentioned, there's been a lot of work done in the triangle over the years, but with a narrow and small target focus. This is a property position roughly around our Telegraph project as it existed at a moment in time in 1991. At least 50 companies have done work on what is now our Telegraph property. Every one of those companies added a little bit more geological information, another piece to the puzzle. And we've assembled all of that information. We've put the pieces together. And for the first time, we're seeing the big picture and we're really liking what we're seeing. Our timeline on this has, has been quite rapid. In early 2021, we recognized this area as an important target. Over the next few months, we carried out a lot of very detailed geological research, pulling together all of this information, analyzing it, evaluating it. By April, we had pulled together multiple 
property agreements and we pulled them all together simultaneously working with each in the background quietly and in april we announced that multiple agreements to lock down the core ground two field seasons have brought us to the point where we've now ground truth all the historic information we've made new discoveries and we're ready to go ahead and, and drill this program over this coming season 30 min file occurrences on what is now our property each one of these a piece of the puzzle and all of that information part of what we're working from now to put this property this project into perspective on on a scale basis if we look at the saddle um and on on this uh inset the colored part sitting over top of our uh, the central part of our claims is the saddle and the saddle north deposits on the same scale as our property you can see on here we've got the yeti and the yeti north on the right side of this we've got the dock trend on on the left side of it and then to the north of it we've got a newly found eight kilometer strata gossen trend any one of those rivals the saddle saddle north in terms of of scale and a reminder newmont paid 350 million dollars to buy this deposit in 2021 doing the same thing with the billion ton galore deposit again at the same scale you can see that we've got a lot of scope on this property for major discoveries now and again unfortunate that i can't <clears throat> i'm not able to point but if you look at that photograph on the left side there you can see if many of you have heard of uh, jeff kaiba and and his red line concept of exploration in the golden triangle jeff while he was working for the provincial government pointed out that most of the deposits in the Golden Triangle are very close to the line that divides Triassic rocks from the Jurassic Age rocks. Now, if you look at that photograph, the horizontal layers at the top of that peak is the Jurassic uh, Hazelton group. The lower rocks, which are not stratified, represent the Triassic Stuhini group. The dividing line is the red line. Clearly, we're in the right neighborhood. But even more important on that photograph, that massive Gossen in the front of the picture is really significant. A Gossen is the rusty area that results from the weathering of metals in a big geological system that contains a lot of metal. So we've got in, in this environment that is perfect for hosting porphyries, we've got a big Gaussian, meaning that there's a lot of metal in that geological system, or at least in, in this part of the geological system. That Gaussian is part of an eight kilometer trend that shows on the upper part of that map on the right side. We have found copper values all over this, and it has seen almost no exploration in the past. The little bit of work that was done on this property was focused on the dock trend, and primarily the north end of the dock trend and the south end. There used to be a property line that divided the dock trend, and there wasn't a lot of work done in the area that sat on or near that uh, former property line so when we started work on this property we jumped in and we really focused on that that property line and we've come up with some of our best results in that area that saw little exploration in the middle of the trend that wasn't previously explored now we've pulled together a massive amount of data from the previous work We've stitched together geophysics and, and geochemistry and, and geology and all kinds of other information. 
from these previous operators. We've extended all that information. And <clears throat> we're seeing a perfect alignment of geology, of geophysics and geochemistry. For any geologists in this, this, the audience here today, I'm sure you'll understand the significance of having rocks of the right age, being in the right neighborhood, of, of seeing widespread copper and gold values, with copper values up to 19.7%, with multigram gold values over kilometers. And <clears throat> really looking at this for the first time ever on a comprehensive basis. We are very, very excited about what we're seeing here. And and, and again, just little snippets of how we've, we've got this trend that was explored historically where the geophysics and the, the geochemistry line up. Now, we conducted um, last summer a fairly comprehensive geophysical program, ground-based induced polarization, IP, along with magnetotellurics. And that big area toward the uh, the right side is a classic porphyry signature from an IP program. And it aligns exactly with the area that we're seeing the multi-percent copper values up to 19.7% copper on surface, aligning with this geophysical signature. Now, the only drilling anywhere on this extensive property was in this dock zone toward the upper left of the photo. There were five holes drilled in the early 70s, very shallow holes, and we don't have the results of those holes. And then in 2014, there were two holes drilled in exactly the same area. Other than that, there is no drilling on this property. Now, the holes that were drilled in 2014 were drilled based in part on those three IP lines that were done in 2012. You can see the area where the holes are drilled. There is a subtle IP anomaly. And the results of the drill holes were, well, in terms of grade, not great. But we have looked at those holes and it is our interpretation that those holes sit on the periphery of a large porphyry deposit. We brought in last summer one of the top porphyry experts in the world. He looked through this core in great detail and he also toured all over the property. He agrees totally with our interpretation that those holes are on the periphery of a porphyry system and that this property is highly prospective for a large-scale porphyry discovery. Now, because those holes in 2014, the grades were, let's just say they were geologically encouraging, um, had no interest for investors, and holes that are geologically interesting are the death knell for a project that's funded by a junior. It was the last work that was done on this property until we consolidated the property in 2021 and really carried out a much more comprehensive exploration program. So we've had some of the assay results from this past season. We really like what we're seeing. And on this map, you can see areas with more of those purple triangles are more than a half percent copper from samples that were taken on surface. And we're finding that all over the property. There's three very distinct trends on the right side of the picture. We call it the Yeti trend. The top of it is, is our newfound uh, Strata Gaussian trend. And then on, on the left side is, is the, the dock trend. Every one of those areas we came up with more high-grade copper values. And in fact, in that 
zone that divides the, the in, in the middle of the the dark trend we found samples the size 19.7 percent copper on surface the stratic goss and we found 7.7 percent copper on surface in that area that had hardly been looked at previously now normally i would stop there because bringing on, you know, talking about a second project just creates confusion. But I really have to say just a few words on our Southmore property, because just this morning we put out some very, very significant news on Southmore. Southmore is located a little further south. And by the way, the, the PowerPoint presentation, there's, there's very brief summaries on our other projects. But just to talk very briefly on um, on Southmore. So a little further south, right in the heart of the Golden Triangle, surrounded by world class deposits, we followed up a airborne geophysical survey this past summer with groundwork. We've confirmed the presence of multiple zones of SCARN mineralization. And for anybody not familiar with SCARNs, SCARNs can be some of the biggest and lowest cost copper mines in the world. One example is Antamina in Peru, which ranks in the top 10 copper mines in the world, and it's in the lowest quartile. So SCARNs can be a very, very significant source of, of copper. We've confirmed the presence of extensive zones of SCARN mineralization on the property. We're seeing multi-percent copper values. And we also found gold in the SCARN zones. Two samples had 29 grams per ton of gold and 35 grams per ton of gold in that SCARN zone. So another very, very important discovery. Um, same story, pulled together historic information, consolidated the ground, systematically advanced it. Just like Telegraph, Southmore is also ready for a drilling program this summer. Both projects have permits in place for drilling and the work now is fine tuning the, uh, the planning and the uh, target selection for drilling over the summer. Quick summary, team dedicated to the Golden Triangle, experts in the Golden Triangle, huge property positions, seven separate projects, each with large scale potential, focused on uh, telegraph in the middle of a world-class porphyry district, multiple copper gold targets. We're advancing it rapidly. We're gonna be drilling it. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna have further results from the field work, and we're going to have other corporate announcements with regard to some of our, our secondary um, exploration projects. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Kobe and uh, see if anybody has any questions or anything you want to talk about in more detail. All right. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for the informative presentation. As you alluded to, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, just a reminder again to everyone on the line that you could type your questions into the chat box at any time. So, you know, I'd like to start from the top and kind of work our way down. Um, you know, tell us a, about the company history. When was it founded? And, you know, importantly, how has the strategy and the focus of Mountain Boy changed since its inception? Well, Mountain Boy has a long history in the Golden Triangle. And, and the early history is significant from the perspective that the previous operators accumulated a pretty good uh, ground position. So when I got back into the exploration business, I looked at Mountain Boy, I saw the already impressive property position in the Golden Triangle. I was attracted to it. I, I talked to the, the fellow who's the, the largest shareholder in the company and he, he suggested that I come in and, and run the company. And I did enthusiastically because of that property position. And then since then, we've, we've greatly expanded on the property. In a nutshell, going back three and four years ago, I, I looked at the Golden Triangle and I said, you know what, this area is really significant. We want to get in there. We want to put our arms around as much as we can possibly get, our, get hold of 
because this area is really going to take off. And that, that's exactly what's happening. And, and I'm pleased to say that we now have 650 square kilometers of, of prime real estate in, in this region. Yeah, awesome. That's a huge, huge land package. So, and you know, um, Telegraph itself, that alone is a big package. And you alluded before that it was once explored by over 50 uh, companies um, all across much smaller land packages. So, you know, touching on this point again, you know, how did consolidating the land package help with taking this big picture view? You know, what, what did the old timers uh, miss that you can now see because you've consolidated all the data? Well, no, nobody stood back and looked at it as a big geological system. They, they were looking at the individual occurrences. And like, like so much of the history of this region, you know, a, a century ago, the, the prospectors went through, you know, panning the streams, um, looking for gold and silver veins sticking out of the ground. And, and in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were looking for, for copper and other base metals. So they would come in in the helicopter, they would touch down, they would take a few samples and, and off they would go. In the 80s and 90s, after SNP and SK, then they, they came in looking for gold deposits. And so that this area has copper, it has gold, it, it has silver, it has other base metals, but you, you need to look at it as a package. So it, it, the, the work in the 70s, there was some really good work done by a major in the early 70s on the dock, but they did not even assay for gold. You know, we've got most of, of the work that, that they did from back in that era, and, and they were mm -hmm. looking for copper and secondarily lead. And, and so everything was, was focused on copper and, and literally didn't even assay for gold. Yeah. So they, they weren't seeing it. And, you know, the understanding the geology of the triangle has really emerged over the last few years. So work that was done 70s, 80s, 90s, even, even 10 and 20 years ago, they didn't have the geological understanding that we now have for the the way the systems come together and, and the controls and, and the, the alteration halos that provide, uh, you know, uh, guidelines for how to explore this region. And, you know, touching on, on the, you know, the big picture view, you know, my understanding is that you guys have a, an area on the dock trend that, that you call the border zone and you call it that because presumably it's, it's, well, un between two old un until we consolidated right? this ground, mm -hmm. the property to the north was held by, in fact, it was held by two geologists and, uh, and joint venture to a junior. And the ground to the south was held by an individual geologist who had it for a while in a joint venture with a junior. But they never worked together. Right. And, and I, I imagine they, did they avoid you know, getting too close to the border for that reason? Well, they they each had on the, the central part of their properties, they had what looked to be good targets. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of work done on, on the dock zone by the junior that held the dock zone, all focused on that that one area. But, right. and, and they thought when they drilled those holes, they were going to hit the bullseye. But but they didn't. And, and having drilled a couple of, you know, fairly low grade holes, it really downgraded the project in the eyes of investors. So I think it made it, even if they wanted to go back and, mm -hmm. and further explore it, it was going to be hard because of basically having killed it with a, a couple of, you know, and, and it, I, I think it's a terrible mistake to go into a situation like this and drill two holes because you're basically betting the company on a couple of holes. Yeah. And, and that's that's part of our strategy is let's not just go in and blast holes in the ground and hope for the best. Let's look at this very, very, very carefully. Let's select the best targets and let's make sure that we've got a big enough program that that if we miss on one or two or three holes, we, we've still got enough that, that we can demonstrate what we know is down there. We know it's down there, but it's just mm -hmm. how many holes is it going to take to demonstrate it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, with 
a, a package like this, you know, it's it's so it's big, it's it's target rich. How do you go about, you know, systematically narrowing down uh, your priority targets? Um, you know, which methods are you using, and and what is SWIR? Oh, what what is SWIR? Was that your last question? That was the last part of the question. Yeah, yeah, it stands for shortwave infrared spectroscopy, which is a technique that is used to um, get a lot of information about alteration within a porphyry system. So we've got hundreds of samples that are now going SWIR through SWIR analysis that will provide a vectoring tool. So the, uh, the vectoring that we get out of the, the SWIR analysis of, of the alteration will vector us toward the, uh, the hearts of the porphyry systems. And it's, it's very clear now that we're looking at multiple systems, probably all related to one big system at depth but coming up with, with multiple manifestations. Um, we've spent two years now going through massive amount of historic information, uh, putting it all together, evaluating it, the field work that we've done. We're, we're at a stage now where we know roughly where we want to drill, which is the, the center of, of the dock trend, uh, the border zone. We need a few months more work to get the SWIR results, to integrate all of that with the other information and determine exactly where the holes are gonna be located and the orientation of those holes. Um, we're probably also gonna put some holes into the, the Yeti zone. We're a little earlier stage on that one yet, but we're, we're hoping to get to the point where we can drill that. And we certainly wanna get a couple of holes into the uh, the strata Gaussian zone, um, but that's that's going to take probably the first part of the field season to gather the additional information that we need to fine tune the um, the, the drill hole orientations and locations. So, okay, great. So yeah, you know, it sounds like you've kind of broadly narrowed it down. The only thing left to to really narrow down is, you know, the the location within the location. And, and the orientation, is that is that right? That, that, that's exactly right. We've got the next six months to do that. Mm -hmm. We've still got assays coming in. We've, we've got all the SWIR analysis and we've got all the others and, and we're in the process of integrating the, the previous field season with, with the historic database. So we have some questions on the two historic holes, I believe from, from 2014. So, you know, you, you've since done plenty of work to refine future targets. So, so tell us how these historic drill targets compare to your proposed targets. Um, you know, you mentioned that these holes you believe are on the periphery of a porphyry system. So, so how far out did they miss the target? As well, how deep were these two holes? Well, the the holes were reasonably deep. They were roughly four hundred fifty meters each. Um, they were drilled in the area that the major did the work in the seventies. Uh, you saw on that slide where I showed the 2012 IP lines and there was a subtle IP anomaly. There's some fairly good geochemical um, uh, results in, in the soils on the hillside there. So that was the basis for those holes. Now, when you look at that 2012 IP versus last season's IP, it's night and day. The the difference in the intensity of, of the anomaly. So there, there was a subtle chargeability anomaly mm -hmm. where those old holes were. In our area, we're seeing the, the classic donut uh, chargeability anomaly surrounding right. the low, which is the, the porphyry zone outboard from the intrusion. And we, I, I didn't talk about it, but we've also got mag and, and, and the MT, and the MT is showing, uh, um, you know, the, the resistivity, and, and we've got the mag that also highlights the, the presence of, of the intrusion underlying that uh, area that, that's in the center of the donut. So and, huge improvement on, on the information that we have available. Right, so your targets this time around are, are way much better quality and more prominent. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then on top of that, we're seeing the 
you know, multi-percent copper values in, in surface samples. Right. Yeah. There's plenty of smoke. Yes. Um, so, okay. Okay. Great. And, um, I want to touch on, I'll probably get back to Telegraph, but I, I do want to touch on Southmore as well, because you did put out a news release this morning and it was eyebrow raising, right? You know, you, I remember when the, the geophysical results came out and you had the magnetic anomalies, uh, I believe there were six of them, and you went out, you ground truthed them uh, last field season, and you've returned some good uh, assays. So, you know, that, and, and it, it, you know, that probably in, in your mind and, you know, my, mine as well, I imagine that that takes uh, the quality of these targets or at least the prospectivity of these targets to a whole other level. Um, so my question is, are, are you, these, are these targets mostly SCARN or do you think some of them are SCARN, are SCARNs and some of them are porphyries? There is evidence, there, there's clear evidence of porphyry on the property. And, and we've got extensive porphyries just immediately south of us. Um, now for anybody that's not geological, the difference between a SCARN and a porphyry really is that it the SCARN is based on exactly the same broad geological event, which is an intrusion coming up that carries metal. The metal gets pushed out of the center of the intrusion where those hydrothermal fluids encounter a reactive rock like limestone. They react very quickly rather than disseminating out into the host rock. So there, there's a reaction right around the periphery where the intrusion encounters the limestone. So where there is no limestone and there's an intrusion, there is almost certainly going to be a porphyry. So we're, we're seeing evidence on the property of porphyry, but we, we haven't yet seen it. The scarns are a lot more prominent um, in, in what we're able to see on surface. Okay, okay. Great. So, you know, let's, Southmore is, you know, it's kind of, it sounds like it's more of a secondary asset. Telegraph, of course, being your, your flagship. Um, you've got a bunch of non-core assets. You know, first off, where does Southmore kind of fall in on the priority list? And what are your plans for these non-core assets? You know, are there opportunities to monetize? I, I know you've done that before with I, I believe your silver coin project. So, you know, what, what, where's your head at with regards to trying to JV out or vend out these, these non-core assets? Last summer, we, we started to talk to various potential uh, JV partners on, on several of the projects. There's a lot of interest, but the market being what it was over that period through last fall, um, we got a lot of people coming back saying, we'd love to do something. We can't raise money on it right now. Um, those discussions are underway. We're going to reinvigorate that roundup uh, starting today. In fact, uh, that's going to be a, an important part of our objective at, at roundup is, you know, trying to secure other people's money to advance our secondary projects with regard to Southmore um, over this past weekend, literally when, when we got the assays in, um, it went from being another of our secondary projects to, well, maybe we need to reconsider whether we want to give up an interest in this project at this time. At, at, at the very least, we're going to be looking for significantly better terms than we would have accepted uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, okay, great. That's good color. Um, so as I said before, we're going to move back to Telegraph. Um, we got lots of questions on it, of course. So, um, you know, tell us about your your funding needs to get uh, to to be able to test what you want to test at Telegraph this summer, and and also like you know when do you anticipate actually drilling? Well, drilling in the Triangle usually starts in July. We may be able to start a little bit earlier because our property is a little bit lower elevation. It's kind of in the rain shadow of, of the coast mountains. And uh, 
but but still late June, July, really at the earliest. Um, we will need more funding between now and then. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't want to raise money at, at this share price. We, we've got enough money to conduct a fairly significant program based on what we, we recently raised. We've got other items of working capital that, that can help with the funding. And I'm quite optimistic at this point that we're going to see some action on the, the joint venture slash spin out front that will help in the funding. So over the next few months, as we advance these projects, as we get further information and um, that the story becomes better known, I think we'll be in a stronger position to raise the money that we need to top up to do the, the drill program that we would like to do over the summer. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so a nice potential opportunity for, for non-dilutive funds. Um, so we, we have a question here. If, if you happen to know, Lawrence, you know, what are the copper and gold grades at some of the other porphyries uh, nearby? You know, what are they like, like Shaft Creek and, and Galore Creek? Um, you know, I, I don't have them front of mind at, at the moment. Galore is actually in, in world rankings of, of big cor- uh, porphyry deposits. Galore is quite high up in terms of, of both copper and gold grades. And significantly, Galore is a particular type of porphyry called an alkalic porphyry, which tends to have higher gold contents than, than the classic calc alkalic or uh, uh, other classic porphyry deposits and our property is more like galore than it is the other ones in the district it, we, we've got a lot of indications that ours is also an alkalic porphyry and um, those those types of porphyries you know can be incredibly profitable right like that's what isn't that like new newcrest's flagship mine isn't that an alkalic porphyry and cadia is an alkalic yeah. porphyry and I'm out of date now, but in the 2021 fiscal year, um, Cadia produced $1.2 billion of free cash flow for Newcrest. And and the grades are roughly 0.2 something copper and 0.3 something gold. So it had like a negative uh, all in sustaining cost too, right? For the fiscal 2021 fiscal year, the all-in sustaining cost of gold was negative $100 an ounce. The copper and the silver byproduct paid for all of the operating cost. Right. They got the gold for free. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, so you're you're looking for elephants. You know, you're you're not looking for a little, uh, a small little resource. You're you're looking for a massive. You're looking for the next Cadia. Uh, that that's next that's our dream. Yeah, that, that's our dream. That's that's what we go to work every day to, to to try to make happen. Yep. Okay, and you know, touching on the corporate front now, um, you know, thirty four percent healthy level of insider ownership. But you know, you've got some some investors in there, um, pretty pretty famous investors too. Um, so tell us who they are. Uh, how much do they own? Well. <laughs> Eric Sprott and, and Ross Beatty are both, they, they both filed as insiders. Um, you know, we, we don't like to bandy about names. Ross is an individual investor. He came into the project and um, he filed an insider report. So it, it's in the public domain. Um, clearly, you know, geologists understand this story a lot better than most investors. You know, we've, we've done a way better job on the geology front than we have on the investor relations front. And, and you know, I, I take the knocks for that one. But uh, certainly people that understand geology, and, and Ross is, is a geologist by background, um, understand the significance of, of what we're looking for here. All right, All right. And, you know, speaking of geologists involved and, you know, I like the slide where you, where you showed them all at your, 
uh, at Telegraph for your projects. Um, you know, you earlier last year you you assembled a new uh, technical advisory board, and it's got a team of of poor free experts on there. So tell us about some of the people involved. Well, it, it's it's led by Dusty Nickel, one of our directors, a fellow that I've known forever. He's had a tremendous success in the mining industry, both as as a geologist and and as the CEO of of a for a while, what was an operating mining company. Um, Bruce Gemmel um, is with the University of Tasmania in, in Australia. Um, highly regarded geologist. His specialization is more uh, VMS type deposits, but he also has a lot of expertise in porphyry. He's, he's done some work with us on our, our BA project, which is, is a VMS deposit. He's provided some very valuable insights into the porphyry geology of Telegraph. And, and John Ryan, who was the lead geologist on the Highland Valley deposit for many years, working with tech. And uh, one of the leading experts in, in BC porphyry geology. And, and again, looked at this and, and was enthusiastic to be involved with us and, uh, and, and provide his guidance. Great. Okay, so to wrap things up, maybe just tell us, you know, top two or, or three reasons um, to be excited about Mountain Boy today. Well, if you take a longer term perspective on it, we are moving toward multiple large scale discoveries in one of the most prolific uh, mineral districts in, in the world. We've got a, a fabulous team of, of geologists and of geological experts that are helping to make that happen. We've got further news coming in the very near term. Um, we're still waiting for assays on, on the Telegraph project. And those could be, I mean, who knows what comes out of the labs, but that, that could be a significant news release coming in the near term. And we're working toward um, joint venture partners on other projects that will lever our ability to um, move projects forward on, on a very cost-effective basis and, and provide multiple shots at a, at a discovery um, within Mountain Boy. Great. All right. Well, with that, uh, you know, Lawrence, I'd like to thank you for your time. It's a pleasure hosting you and uh, I'm excited for you. You know, this summer is going to be a potentially game-changing year for, for Mountain Boy as you guys embark on your uh, maiden drill program at Telegraph. Um, and to our viewers, if you want to learn our thoughts on Mountain Boy, as well as other companies that we watch, we do publish all of our research on our website. Uh, it's totally free of charge. Uh, just a reminder that our next webinar will take place on January 24th, so that's tomorrow when Dave Talbot sits down with Corora Resources. Again, that is tomorrow at 2 p.m. EST, 11 a.m. Pacific. Thank you for tuning in and have a great day. And thanks again, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Kobe, for uh, your support. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for the time to hear our story. Look forward to the next update.